Hi, everybody. In 2006, I had the opportunity to give a sermon in Streetsville United Church in July of 2006, and I chose Solomon and his times. Because uh, in the wake of 9-11 and the subsequent invasion of Iraq, there was a lot of talk in the air about Western values. And so it was a good time for me to meditate upon what Western values are and what they should be. And, of course, the life and legacy of Solomon comes to mind, or should come to mind, if we're contemplating a Bible example of someone who had it all and lost it. And lost it not just for himself, but for his descendants and the empire, and specifically the nation, the United Nation of Israel that he himself ruled for 40 years, a relative peace. But the cost of that peace was immense. So I couldn't help but think of a book I'd already read at that point, Solomon, His Life and Times, by Frederick William Farrer. Farrer was an Anglican clergyman. He, had, he was chaplain to Queen Victoria. He actually preached at Charles Darwin's funeral. So he was very close to the core, the heart of the British Empire. And that, of course, at the time, the empire was the greatest empire the world had ever seen. So I don't doubt that Farrer, when he wrote this book, was thinking deeply about the parallel with the risks and the compromises that empire always seems to require of rulers. So I wrote the, the sermon and I wanted to just read it to you, if you don't mind. I'll read it straight from the screen because I have no hard copy. The subheading of Solomon in all his glory which is the actual title, Solomon in All His Glory. The subheading I chose was Comfort and Control, Compromise and Catastrophe. Solomon, much of the Old Testament is devoted or credited to him. 31 chapters of Proverbs, 20 more in Ecclesiastes and the Song of Songs, 20 more in Kings and Chronicles. And one might easily make the case that much of the rest of the Old Testament is written to trace the legacy of Solomon in the history of the divided kingdom. Yet when we hear the name of Solomon, is it his political legacy we think of first? There are surprisingly few books about Solomon and his times, even from Christian sources. Could this reflect our discomfort with the lessons his life and legacy leave for our contemplation? Solomon, no name has passed into the common tradition of our language, which is bound so intimately with the words wealth, wisdom, and women. It is therefore very interesting that in subsequent centuries the nation of Israel was far more fascinated with Solomon than they were with his father David. Why? What fascinates the worldly mind? Well, wealth, ostentation, sex and splash, the showy display of one's means of life as John puts it in 1 John 2:15 to 17. But equally fascinating as the world's attraction to the legend of Solomon is his comparative neglect in the New Testament. Christ mentioned Solomon only twice, once in the Sermon on the Mount, in counseling the disciples, do not worry about your life. Quieting the anxieties regarding normal needs, Christ pointed at the gorgeous lilies of Galilee. Not even Solomon, he said, not even Solomon in all his glory was arrayed as one of these. The second time the Lord mentioned Solomon, somewhat less famously, was in judgment upon his own generation. The Queen of the South came from the ends of the earth, Christ solemnly warned, to hear the wisdom of Solomon, but someone greater than Solomon is here. The Queen of Sheba, Christ insisted, would rise up in the judgment with that generation and would condemn it. We see that Christ, unlike Jewish tradition, pays no homage to the wonders of Solomon's wealth and harem. The Old Testament, by contrast, is far more concerned with the gifts and the greatness of this king. What were the gifts which, fabled, which this fabled king possessed to a unique degree? First, the wealth he was born to. We can hardly measure it in today's dollars. We do know, though, that the temple which he built for the worship of Yahweh cost by today's measure billions. Compare our former Sky Dome, that's the Sky Dome in Toronto, now called the Rogers Centre, which in 1989 dollars cost less than half a billion. 
Yet the temple itself was merely the size of Streetsville United Church Sanctuary. In other words, the average size church. However, not even St. Peter's in Rome was gold-plated as Solomon's temple was. But obviously Christ's reference to Solomon's wisdom has more weight than his passing reference to Solomon's fleeting glory. Kings tells us Solomon spoke 3,000 Proverbs, and we have a few hundred of them to this day in the Old Testament book of Proverbs. He composed over 1,000 songs, we are told. We have also a handful of them in the Psalms and the Song of Solomon, or Canticles. We're also told that Solomon spoke of the great cedars of Lebanon and the humble hyssop on the garden wall, of beasts both significant and seemingly insignificant. God gave him, we are told, not only wisdom, that rarest of human attributes, but also largeness of heart, like the sand of the seashore. And the beginning of this great wisdom, the intro to the book of Proverbs informs us, was the fear of Yahweh. Solomon's fear and wisdom shine most brightly in his prayer of dedication when the temple was complete. That's in 1 Kings chapter 8, by the way. It is a prayer overflowing with thanksgiving, of recognition of human fragility and frailty, of the spirit of all true supplication, the recognition of our total dependence on God's mercy. Hear us from heaven, your true home, Solomon prays, and dwell with us forever, even as we dwell obediently in your presence. Never leave us or forsake us. And here we have, in fulfillment of that request, the greatest of all the gifts to Solomon. Despite all the splendor of that temple, all the manifest glory of Solomon's reign, there now arrived a supreme gift, the personal Shekinah glory of Yahweh, pleased to dwell among a people whose priority was manifestly the public worship of the true God. In those days, God indeed dwelt upon the earth as well as in heaven. So in the second segment, we will look at the question of how will Solomon's wisdom survive his empire priorities, which were wealth, war, and women.